Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Simon Phipps joins me. We're going to be talking about looking for licensing and copyright in your code with Scan Code. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Simon Phipps. Episode 471, recorded February 14th, 2018. Scan code. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Cloud Spanner from Google Cloud Platform. Cloud Spanner is the only horizontally scalable and strongly consistent relational database service. To learn more, visit g.co slash getspanner today. And by IT Pro TV, the fun and entertaining way to sharpen your IT skills. Visit itpro.tv slash floss and use the code FLOSS30 to get a free seven-day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open-source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Solenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you may want to download and play with right after the show. I think today is going to be one of those. This week, welcome back, my co-host, my wonderful, talented co-host, Simon Phipps. Welcome back. Uh, it's good to be back, Randall. This is almost a, a permanent engagement. I, this is my <laughs> like my fifth show in Six weeks or something. Oh my God! Well, well, we'll definitely give you next week as a break because it's more about a. It's more about well, it's about the pearl programming language, which um, it, I'll probably. It's about more something that involves actual skill and knowledge, and I don't have any of that. So <laughs> you need to get rid of me for next week. Well, uh, I am speaking to you. For those that can see the background here, I am speaking to you from the eleventh floor of. Uh, uh, Zip Recruiter's head office in Santa Monica. I'm here this week to uh, do some training, and um, I'm leaving actually early tomorrow, so it's going to be like just in and out. Uh, I'm in a different room than I normally am in. This room is called Malibu because it's on the Malibu side of the building, whereas uh, sometimes I'm on the other side. It's called Catalina because you can actually see Catalina Island from there. Uh, most of the rooms you've seen at Zip Recruiter are – much smaller rooms, but I couldn't get one of the small rooms today. So it's this, this room is really, really wide. So you still get a great view. I'll move it away for a second. Maybe not. Okay. Of, of these great pictures there. Um, so anyway, uh, today's show is about an interesting project, fascinating project. Uh, uh, again, one of these times that I am totally um, uh, astounded by the fact that uh, there's there's so much open source software. I don't know everything that's out there, but uh, this show was suggested to me, I think, by the project leader that we're bringing on in a few minutes, uh, Philippe. I'm going to mispronounce the name, Philippe Omridan. I should have asked before the show how it's pronounced, but I think I probably got it close. Uh, um, so what it does, it's called scan code, and what it does is it can evaluate a tree of software, like a distribution, or maybe what you currently have in production or whatever, so your, your source code repository. And it goes in and uses a number of heuristic tools to figure out um, what kind of licenses are involved, what kind of packages are involved, what kind of distributions are required to make this thing work. Uh, this looks like a, sounds like a really clever thing. What, what, do you, what do you know about this so far, Simon? Um, I don't know anything at all about it beyond what's on on the website, which I have over here on the screen. You can't see, and okay. uh, uh, it, it it there are a number of other tools like this, uh, like Fossology, for example, and there are proprietary tools that uh, vendors who shall remain unnamed use and sell you for outrageously large sums of money. So a truly open source uh, package that does this would be very useful, and I'm particularly interested to find out if it's integrated into uh, continuous integration tools like Jenkins, because I'm a big Big advocate of making uh, licensing compatibilities. Comp I'm a big advocate of making licensing compatibilities be a uh, a reason to fail a build, and uh, I think that everybody should f have their builds fail if uh, the licenses in the tree aren't compatible with each other, as a way of forcing the issue early on in the process rather than requiring expensive legal review later. So I'm going to be uh, asking about that, and uh, I'm interested overall to find out uh, what's going on, because I gather Philippe used to be a, 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 a moderator on Slashdot, so uh, that would be cool. interesting to find out his perspective on that as well. And the, and the one other thing is I was doing the research this morning for the show. I went, you know, this sounds an awful lot like something else I chatted with or had on the show sometime recently. And I figured it out that it was when we had OpenHub on, which is a, a huge repository that Black Duck puts together 
to about all sorts of open source distributions. You can see what's hot, what's not, what's new in a particular area, and so on. We had them on at the OSCON show last year, and not related directly to uh, OpenHub was they have a proprietary tool, probably one of the ones you were thinking of, Black Duck, right? That actual scan for uh, license compliance and things like that, but that's not part of their open source project. So uh, I was going to say, how is this different from that? But this is totally different in that it's open source. That's even better. So yeah. <laughs> great. Uh, anything else before we bring on our guest? No, that, that, that's it. And you mentioned the names of one of those companies that I've been resisting the urge to mention. So. <laughs> I have a lot of friends that work at Black Duck, so I, I don't mind uh, promoting them. They were a big Pearl user, a big Pearl shop for a long time, contributed a lot to many, many Pearl projects. So I'm happy that uh, they, uh, they, they get to shout out every once in a while. Well, before we bring Philippe on, I do have an important message. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by CloudSpanner from Google Cloud Platform. We've all come to expect that distributed databases can't be both relational and scalable. But what if you didn't have to make trade-offs? What if you could have a fully managed database service that's consistent, scales horizontally across data centers, and speaks SQL? Introducing Cloud Spanner, a mission-critical relational database service from Google Cloud Platform, built from the ground up and battle-tested at Google for strong consistency and high availability at global scale. Cloud Spanner delivers scalability, high transaction performance, and strong consistency across rows, regions, and continents with an industry-leading 99.999% availability SLA. No planned downtime. Enterprise-grade security. Multi-language support. Client libraries in C Sharp, Go, Java, Node.js, PHP, Python, and Ruby. JDBC driver for connectivity with popular third-party tools. Pricing is simple and predictable. So learn more about Cloud Spanner at g.co slash getspanner today. That's g.co slash getspanner. One more time, g.co slash g-e-t-s-p-a-n-n-e-r. And we thank Cloud Spanner from Google Cloud Platform for their support of Floss Weekly. Well, let's go ahead and bring in our guest. Philippe, welcome to the show. Hey, welcome. And where are you speaking to us from? Actually based in Brussels at the moment. I have the weird privilege to be both a French and US citizen. And okay. I spend part of my time in, in Brussels and part in California. And awesome. um, Awesome. So, so give me the, give me the thirty thousand foot view. And how, how close did I did I was able to kind of tag that in? Uh, what problem are you solving when you're reaching for uh, uh, scan code? Well, one of the getting item to reuse free library and open source software is to ensure that you know the license. And it's true whether you are an open source project. You want to make sure you're using a license that's compatible with your own license. It's true if you're in a commercial proprietary closed source organization and you want to make sure that whatever the license of software you use is matching your policy. And what we're trying to do very simply is to make sure eventually licensing is no longer something you have to search for. It's just there, easy to find, easy to discover and becomes a non-issue. Now, what's an example of the output of this? Okay, so if I did, I, was I accurate about I could run it over my own code base, or I could run it on something I just downloaded to see what the licenses are? Yes. So you can. It's a common line tool at the moment. There's a server version that's been contributed uh, last summer, uh, but needs a bit of refinement. So it's primarily a common line tool and library. And you point it to uh, a download or some uh, checkout of your own code, and in terms of output, you can select JSON or SPDX, HTML, and uh, you can select different type of scans, primarily around license and copyrights, but there's a few others coming up. And, and how did this project get started? Well, uh, actually back in 2008, um, I was at the, moment, at the time working uh, still with the same company. Uh, what we're doing were ID based on Eclipse. So we're very active in the Eclipse community. We had a, a distro called Easy Eclipse, which had about 2 million downloads, which is not too shabby by any open source standards. And uh, a customer came to us and said, well, we're buying all these companies. You seem to know a bit about open source, saying we'd like to know if there's open source in the code that uh, uh, of this company we're buying. And so we did the first gig, and we found tons of stuff, of course, tons of stuff that the original company didn't knew about. 
And then being toolsmith, we started scratching our reach and looked at what was wrong. And the, the worst fossology, and which was and still is written mostly in C and uh, PHP. And that was pretty much it. Everything else was proprietary. We looked at both the proprietary and open source option and really didn't like what we were getting for that, both in terms of architecture, uh, code environment, or price. And we started to write something because of that. Okay, uh, we actually had a question from the chat room already. Um, is scan code just looking for licenses or does it gather other data too, like lines of code? Um, what do you mean by lines of code, like counting lines of code? Yeah, yeah. It can count the lines of code, but that's fairly trivial. Uh, what it looks like is license, copyright, EML, URLs, uh, and any kind of type information around the file. Plus, it parses and normalizes all the package manifests it may find. And it has a fairly large view of what the package is. For instance, a Windows DLL has metadata, which are package-like, so it will parse that. Uh, it would consider a Debian package, an RPM, a Python wheel, a, a node, package.json, Ruby gems, all these as being packaged. Wherever you have structured metadata, this will be squeezed, extracted, and normalized in a, in a package manifest model. There must be literally hundreds of those, right? So how do you keep track of all those and, 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 and keep adding new things? Or is that what your community has been doing for you? Well, a lot of it is, is about the community. Uh, effectively, there's a lot of new licenses that pop up every day, either very old licenses that are seldom seen, or new licenses, and I wish there were less creativity in that area, but it sounds like everyone wants to come with its uh, own license. So the, the key thing, I think, in terms of architecting a bit the, the product and, and the tool was to ensure that it would be very easy to contribute new licenses and a new way to detect. Um, and I think that's essential because otherwise you have, uh, uh, if you have something that's complicated, it's, it's a barrier to adoption, it's a barrier to contribution, and, and that's not, not a virtuous kind of a situation to be in. So um, does this also detect plagiarism or is it just looking for licensing information? So there's, Actually, in my, in my language, I like to talk about two, two different things. One is scanning, and the other one is matching. Matching would be plagiarism detection. That means you have a large index of code, and you're trying to find similarities with the code you, you, you're trying to match, uh, to match. Scanning, I see this more as something that's intrinsic, so you look at the code without looking outside and you try to squeeze and extract as much information as you do. So scan code is about scanning using that this, this definition. There's a new tool that's coming up. It's going to be called, guess what, match code. To do matching, uh -huh. that means uh, being able to build, assemble a large repository of source code, index it with a lot of interesting and funny uh, uh, hashing schemes and kind of a mathematic construction that allows to do large-scale div quickly and, and then do an efficient and effective matching at, at various levels as our whole packages, uh, file trees, files, or eventually down to the snippet level, which is eventually the, the kind of tools that are offered by some of the commercial vendors. I think, unfortunately, that these tools have been very poorly done um, because they provide way too many false positives. And the problem in any kind of search application, if the search results are wrong, because there's too many of it and they're not accurate enough, then you're wasting more time reviewing the results than actually uh, getting effective information. Right. Um, and when you say uh, licenses, are you just looking for OSI approved open source licenses or are you looking for uh, other licensing terms as well? So. We're looking at any available license term that we can put our hands on. That means anything that's public. Um, I, I happen to be one of the co-founders of uh, SPDX. Mm -hmm. So we're looking, of course, at all the SPDX licenses from uh, the license list, all the OSI approved licenses, plus each and every other variance we can put our, our hands on. To give you an idea today, there's about 1,000-ish license references. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have only about 350 in SPDX. Uh, so there's about six, 600 ish licenses which don't exist in PDX. Some of them may be free proprietary. A lot of them are 
free and open source, but they're just less common. And right. we're adding we're adding probably one to to ten every week. Now the other thing is that we don't detect only the license text, but also all the notices and mentions. So it could be a simple word like GPL, or it could be the thirty seven thousand bytes of an Afro GPL full text. And that's part of the challenge is how can you effectively detect accurately uh, just mere mention of a GPL versus a whole file and knowing that all these can be mixed in many different ways and different uh, at different level of uh, uh, volume and different files and sometimes mixed together. Now, of course, that, that raises some other questions. But before we uh, dig into those, uh, um, you and I both know what SPDX is. Uh, there's quite a few people listening who don't. Do you, would you like to say what SPDX is? Yes. So SPDX came about to provide a way to reliably exchange licensing information between consumer and provider of software. Think of it a bit like... Uh, EDI in the old days in the electronic data interchange in uh, manufacturing industries. So it's, it's kind of the same idea, but simpler and such that you can formalize how you provide information about licenses, how you uh, document this for a product, uh, a package or, or many of these, and you can send that over to someone else who may have different tools, but will be able to read this and process it in a formal way. It's, it's kind of a better way to exchange licensing information than a, a PDF, a Word document, or a, a LibreOffice uh, uh, spreadsheet. Uh, so, it, or to put it differently, it's a, a metadata format and a repository of standardized uh, uh, abbreviations for all known licenses, both open source and uh, proprietary licenses that pretend to be open source. That's a good way to put it. I, I, I always avoid the word meta in data because it's a big word for me. Right. <laughs> uh, so now the question I was going to come back to is that uh, in licensing, um, uh, it's, it's devilish difficult to detect what license a piece of software is under, but it's double devilish di difficult to detect things like uh, modifications and exceptions to licenses. So how good a job does scan code do at finding out that, for example, a piece of code is under the GPL plus a packaging exception, or that there is a special exception to a particular rule of the Affair GPL. Yeah. So when we started, I looked at the technology and the approaches done by pretty much every tool. And I came to the conclusion that there was only one correct way to detect licenses. And this way is to do a diff. That means you want to have a bunch of license references on the one end, and you have your code on the other end, and you do a pairwise diff between uh, all these files on your index side and all your code base file. Now, the problem there is it's very quickly intractable. Think about a Linux kernel. That's about 70-ish uh, thousand files. Uh, on the scan code side, there are about 6,000 texts, either short mention of licenses or full text. Each mention of a license may appear more than once in a code file of the kernel side. So you need to do multiple time a diff of 6,000 files against one. And that's, say, say you do five on average. So you have now 30,000 diffs against 70,000. And that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. Uh, that means eventually days, weeks, months, years of computation, um, and that's not uh, that's not possible. So all the trick is to be able to, on the one end, collect as many possible mentions. So if you were talking about Afro GPL and exception, there's a text somewhere in scan code in the license uh, index, which is the Afro and all the variants of Afro GPL va uh, notice variants that we were able to put our hands on. On the other hand, there's the test of the exceptions. Together also, there's maybe the text of the exception and the FRO license. And then we do a diff. And all the trick is to do this diff as fewer times as, fewer times as possible, because otherwise it takes years. Uh, on my laptop, it takes about 20 minutes to scan the 70,000 files of a whole kernel, uh, which is better than a few years. All right. 
So uh, in the chat room, um, the, uh, the the listener, Jojo Dancer, has been asking about where all the data that's driving scan code is stored. Uh, uh, is it all stored in a central location? And it, uh, does that cause any security issues? Uh, there's no, scan code doesn't store, uh, there's no data uh, outside of the, the repo. Everything is self-contained. Uh, it's actually something that I need to work on because there's been requests to reuse the license data set and the copyright data set and the test data set separately from scan code, especially from the folks at Debian. Um, but so there's no, there's a directory uh, in the source code tree, which has for each license text and samples that we, we, we collect, there's a text and there's a small YAML file side by side, which says, oh, this is this and this and these licenses. Uh, but everything is self-contained. There's no central external repository and no no security issue in particular there that I could fathom. Right, right. So does scan code uh, check for license compatibility or is that a, an exercise left for the reader? It's completely an exercise left to the reader uh, because it's really in the eye of the beholder. Uh, if you feel strongly about free software, you want to make sure you use no proprietary software and you have a certain stance on license policy. If you're in a proprietary context, you're going to have another point of view. If you're working on Apache project, you're going to have yet another point of view. So um, there's there's a few things that I strongly believe about licensing compatibility, but I, it just doesn't make sense to, to share that. Uh, that would be fairly easy to add plugins. Uh, we've added a new plugin architecture uh, uh, since last summer to add plugins to do assertions about compatibility. Uh, but again, the problem, it's, it's really a matter of uh, uh, point of view on the one end. But again, there are a few cases which are clear cut. For instance, uh, linking with GPL to me in my book would mean the resulting code should be GPL. Now, scan code doesn't know that you are linking or not. So looking at just license at rest is not super useful to make this kind of conclusion about license compatibility. Right. You may be using in your code... Uh, GPL license code, maybe for test, build, or tools, which doesn't have a bearing on your Apache license. Uh, and you may be using a proprietary compiler and your code may still be GPL too. So uh, uh, the, the, there's other tools uh, to actually that we have to, to deal with that. There's one called Trace Code, which is a system called Tracer, which can tell you exactly which subset of your code base is built in a given uh, software binary or artifact and how they're linked and combined together. But that, that requires execution of a build. That's a different uh, different kind of animal altogether. Right. Now, I could see that it would be very useful for people to have some sort of uh, uh, ready-built matrix of assertions, but I can also see how it would be legally problematic to make available that matrix of assertions because it contains embodied with it a whole load of legal opinions about the compatibility of licenses. But uh, maybe you could extract data from TLDR legal or somewhere like that to uh, to uh, at least get started that matrix. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure there's much of, in term of information in terms of compatibility on TLDR legal. I, I know the site quite well. I've never seen anything that uh, uh, fell to me that way. Uh, for instance, so I'm working these days a lot with the the folks of the, the Linux kernel to ensure that we provide clear licensing information. And it's surprisingly difficult because there's a lot of file. It's large old code base and everybody thinks, oh, the kernel is GPL2. But actually, there's 80, over 80 different licenses in the kernel. Uh, now, I'm very comfy and familiar with the policy and the licensing policy of the kernel, but it's very specific to the kernel and, and it doesn't apply to many other organizations. Again, so it's, there, there, there are a few essential, which I would think invariant and truth, that lawyers probably would consider as a legal opinion. So combining some way uh, GPL license code with non-GPL license code may result in the, the combination to be GPL license. And I think that should be the way. Uh, but there's so many nuances that even if you could come with such policy, uh, that, that would be difficult. Now, it may be interesting to have a reasoning engine that could reason on <clears throat> a policy that would be data defined and that you could then apply and the work would be first to define your policy so you could then reason about compatibility. But you need to know mm -hmm. not only the license, but also how things are combined, how they are used, 
and, and when and how? Do things run in the same process? Is there dynamic, static linking? Has there been modifications? All the kind of things right. that uh, just the bare licensing doesn't tell you. It's, it's not enough, unfortunately. Uh, you, so it's certainly, I, you know, I completely agree that it's, it's, it's devilishly complex. Uh, my dream is to be able to have a plugin for something like Jenkins that fails the build when somebody adds new code that's under a license that isn't compatible with the rest of the package. And um, I, I haven't seen a tool that does that yet. Uh, it seems to me to be something that needs custom programming. And I wondered whether scan code uh, could be used for that or whether that's something that you'd be interested in providing. So there's been uh, uh, feature requests for that already a couple of times. Um, I know there are folks which are using it uh, as part of their drinking build. And we just need to finish the thing. Um, the... The, the difficulty there in terms of uh, continuous and build integration is being able to avoid having too much noise. So well, the ideal case is, go ahead. No, no, keep, keep going. Sorry, I interrupted. No, so, so my, my point is that uh, uh, if you have a, a large product code base that you scan, or even if it's a small repo, it's not so much the license that would, that are detected that would be interesting to f surface during a CI build, but rather uh, what are the differences in terms of license, copyright origins, and packages with the latest build. And there's an upcoming tool that's going to be called Delta Code to actually provide summarized differences. It's kind of diff tool on data uh, for scan code data. Uh, to provide differences between version one of a scan, version two of a scan. And when you think of it, once you've established the first pass and review the first scan, and you run a scan as part of your CI, maybe on every commit, maybe once a week on, on every tag, what matters is what has changed in terms of copyright license and third party packages since the last build. And that's, that's, that's where it, it can become really effective. Otherwise, uh, applying systematically, so you could apply also a policy on top of that. There's an upcoming plugin that's been contributed that's in a branch to apply a policy that means raising flags based on some licenses. Uh, and the two would be really the thing that matters. Because you, again, in a build, the difficulty is if you have a lot of noise, then folks... Either we'll turn it off, turn off the checks, or don't look at them at all uh, if it's not something that can be effectively processed and resolved by, by the developers working with the code. Well, I know this is uh, one of Simon's favorite subjects, so I'm sure he has like a bunch more questions to ask, but I wanted to get in edgewise here and ask a few things. But before I do that, I do have an important message because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Sharpen your IT skills and empower your team with IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV offers over 3,300 hours of binge-worthy on-demand training with more than 125 hours added weekly. Stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on-demand worldwide via Chromecast, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, PC, or by using their iOS or Android apps. There's no need to go off-site for training. IT Pro TV does IT live every day, so you know you're getting the most current IT training. Courses include CEHV9, CISA, SQL Server 2016, Azure 70-533, CCNA Security, CompTIA A+, and more. Track your team's results and prove the ROI of your training spend with IT Pro TV's supervisor portal. Gain full control over your team's training schedule. Create custom groups and training assignments. View logins, viewing time, video downloads, and course completion tracking. See individual and group analytics. Check out their team solution for group pricing. If you're interested in learning more about IT Pro TV's team solution, contact them for a team free trial, including their supervisor portal at itpro.tv slash floss. Or sign up for individual monthly membership and a free seven-day trial at itpro.tv slash floss and use the code FLOSS30. You'll receive 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your active subscription. Join the more than 90,000 IT Pro TV members today. Premium subscriptions, which include unlimited transcender practice exams and virtual labs, are normally $857 a year. But you only pay $600 when you go to itpro.tv slash floss and use the code FLOSS30. Flexible training, binge-worthy content, ROI proven. And we thank IT Pro TV 
for their support of Floss Weekly. Now, here's my next question that came out of this. I don't, I don't think uh, Simon addressed this yet, but you're talking about licenses, and we usually think of that in terms of licenses for software, but we also have this whole class of licenses for text, like uh, Creative Commons. Uh, does uh, scan code also look for things like that? Yeah, it, it covers pretty much all the license available, so that includes uh, all the Creative Commons. Uh, there's a pending ticket, and somebody had started to work on that, but didn't follow through to add all the translations of the Creative Commons license, and there's a lot of these. Um, but yes, so it's anything that's used in the context of software. So all the Creative Commons uh, uh, license, of course, do matter there. Yeah, and uh, I'm actually one of the audience members that didn't know what SPDX was, so I'm glad to, I'm glad Simon asked that. Um, and that, the, the way it got described reminded me immediately of, of uh, Creative Commons because Creative Commons is a nice short identifier that points at the actual license over somewhere else. So that's a yep. that's similar to that. Now, how good are you are identifying like an ad, a complete ad hoc license? Uh, you know, this this can only be used for this, and it's copyright by <laughs> this guy, or does that come out just in the fact that you're looking at all copyrights? So, so uh, l let's track back for a second. You were talking about Fossology and a lot of these tools, uh, the tools that exist in this space. Mm -hmm. Most, if not all of the tools, use one or, or two approaches. The first one is to do regular expression. That's Fossology. It has a database of about 2,000 regular expressions, which are looking for the substance of common words and patterns found in licenses. The other mm -hmm. approach is to do a probabilistic search. So that's traditional information retrieval. Uh, it's really the, the search engine approach. You're trying to find a ranked list of results that are the most approaching based on your query, knowing that the query is the full text, the, the index is the, the, the set of licenses. Uh, both of these approaches are actually terribly bad at providing any kind of effective and accurate result, results on, on at scale. Um, to me, the only approach that works is the diff. Because diff, you cannot lie. And diff, again, uh, uh, if you have a difference that's big and, and or small, then you may detect things which are large difference, but are as similar as possible to one existing license. So that's how you can detect things that were not known ahead of time. Um, in the context of regular expression, you're constrained by your set of regular expression. Um, and you have to write them. And we all love regular expression, but uh, that, that's a pain. Um, so to me, the, the, the thing is really anything that's either probabilistic or based on regex is either hard to maintain, inaccurate, or incorrect in many cases. Um, the beauty of just dumping text and doing diffs is uh, that there's no there's no possibility of approximation or, or errors uh, within a certain bounds and threshold. Uh, but you get you get always results, and you always get uh, mostly accurate and correct results. So. Um a lot of stuff that's being done these days is being done with um, aggregators like Docker. So in Docker, mm -hmm. I say I want you know this package and this package from the the Docker Hub. Are you able to uh, scan code able to go out and look at Docker to see what the licenses are? Uh, so on the Docker registry, not specifically on the Docker image, um, indirectly, a Docker image is no more no less than a root file system. Um, so we have a built a special to, specialized tool called Conan for container analysis, which is able to do a static analysis and extraction and reconstruction of the Docker layer and images, uh, uh, different stratification of uh, and layering of uh, the slice of root file system in the Docker image. Um, now there's there's two major issues with uh, Docker and container images at large. Um, first. There's a lot of things which are used, packages which are installed as is. So you use an Alpine package or Debian or an RPM, which can be installed pretty much as is. So it's not super efficient in this context to look first at doing a low-level scan. You want first instead to query the package manager of 
the, for the, the install package that are in the images and, and work from that because you have binaries and scan code can squeeze a lot of the binaries, but it's still better to have the source as the source of the source. And mm -hmm. the second problem is that everyone wants their Docker image small and lean. Yep. And there are terrible, terrible, absolutely terrible things which are done to do that. One of the common trick is to remove documentation and license text from the images. Yeah. So I could point you, and I've raised tickets there for a long while, for the best of two years, uh, to very well-known official distro image available on Docker, which are built by the distro maintainers themselves, which are stripped from any licensing information. There's not even a text of the GPL. And it has a whole user land with bash and everything else. And there's, it's just a terrible, terrible thing in the making there. Uh, and don't even get me started about security issues, which is in the Docker world, it's, it's another kind of worm that you, you don't want to hear about. We, I, I have a project to eventually uh, solve some of the issues there, but um, that's another, another topic altogether. So I come from the Perl world back in my, it's what paid my bills for most of the last 25 years. One of the things that would then seem to be problematic, although almost every module that's in the CPAN is under the same license as Perl, which unfortunately wasn't mm -hmm. defined for a while. So it was, it was a little ambiguous, but now we actually have uh, Artistic 2, and that seems to be a much a, a saner language, and it's been reviewed by lawyers finally, instead of just being Larry's craft work. Um, so, but... Those modules that make up and need to be used by a particular application aren't in the source repo. They're similar to the Docker problem. They're outside. They're up in the CPAN. And it's not until mm -hmm. you actually build the application and install it that you'll have access to the other source codes to get their licenses. Uh, have you already addressed that? Or is, there, or is it a possible problem or somewhere in between? Oh, no. It's a, it's a complete problem. I mean, the, the thing you want to scan ideally is the software that's built. To yeah. some extent, scanning the software uh, in source code form practically uh, is interesting and important, but uh, it's not the software you use, it's not the software you redistribute. Uh, for all practical case, you don't have many obligations for mere usage of uh, most or any of the open source uh, and, and free libre software licenses out there. So. What, what you actually use and deploy matters, and everything that you would fetch at build time, be it from CPAN, PyPy, RubyGems, uh, is part of what you use. And if you redistribute the software, part of your sphere of obligations, requirements, and, and compliance. Um, so what, what we do for now is scan code is we scan what you provide. So if you provide pre-built package and you scan your pre-built package, then we'll find whatever is available there. Otherwise, we just scan the manifest. There's an interesting project done by folks in Germany called the OSS Review Toolkit, uh, which is based on scan code. And what it does, it works on a package as an input, runs a scan, and then detects what type of package manager these, like Gradle, uh, Maven, uh, RubyGems, and, and the likes, and Node, execute uh, the proper commands to fetch all the dependencies, and then runs and scan all these dependencies. So we've not covered that in scan code, but it's been covered by folks using scan code, which is uh, as good as it gets, and it's free and open source too, so it's all merry. Okay, just and it now occurs to me why scan code really doesn't have to look at anything that's outside the source directory for the most part. Because yes, as you do the build, as you do the install step, you're downloading stuff that primarily has to already be licensed under a liberal enough license that you can, uh, you know, install it alongside other software. You're not you're not aggregating that code and then reshipping the result, which for like the GPL can get uh, messy. So. Um, I, I, I see why scan code really doesn't have to work as hard as I thought it would have to to really make that work. So if you, again, if you look, if you scan your built software, you will have all the Perl modules that you fetch from CPAN. You will have all the Ruby gems that you fetch from uh, uh, Ruby gems, 
all your PyPy, all your node uh, dependencies available uh, as part of your scan. So scanning the result of the build is uh, really important and probably as important, if not more important, than scanning the source code itself. Because again, if you say you are using, a, you, you have an Apache-based open source project, and part of your test suite is using GPL license tools and code, you're going to use also maybe build script, which may be GPL license. Uh, this is not what you redistribute. You redistribute an Apache license library, and the fact that you use GCC or a GPL test suite has no bearing on the distributed binaries and source uh, uh, from a usage perspective. So it's really important to look at what is deployed. That's how I call it, development side versus deployed side, knowing both sides can have both source and binaries. Um, so calling that source and binaries uh, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, but looking at what you build, what you deploy is, is really what matters. And it matters for licensing, it matters for bugs, it matters for security. Uh, nobody really cares about the things you use on the development side if they're not part of the, the running code in the end. Now, Philippe, uh, you mentioned there are some other communities that are using uh, scan code. Uh, what is the community basis for this project? You know, is, is this a project that your company is monetizing or is this a community project that's outside the scope of your company? Or, or how, how is the community versus your interest in the project? Oh, the community is great. Um, so we're, we're a bit of an oddball in the sense that everything we do uh, in my company business-wise is about open source software or open source software. Um, um, I cannot say bad word, but, but we're, we're, we're on, hair, on the air. But uh, it's um, a bit like um, when, when you play with yourself. Here it's open source and open source. There's a, it's a bit recursive. <laughs> now, <laughs> I didn't say it. I wanted to say it. I didn't say it. Damn you, these American broadcasters. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you, you, I, I won't have to. If this was in Europe, Randall, we, we, we wouldn't have to be... Just hedging around here. We wouldn't have to be pussying around. I got the hint. You, you, I got the hint. Don't worry I, about I, it. I will not have to pardon my French. But no, okay. so, so the, the, the thing for us is very clear. Uh, we've been doing open source software development as a business since our inception. And there's two things to us. Things that touch the code. That means all the tools to analyze can match uh, are free and open source. Business application, we have only one, it's called Deja Code. It's a proprietary application that's sold as a service on premise. And I come from the world of uh, enterprise resource planning software and, and SAP and Oracle, these big uh, monsters. Uh, we've tried at first to build an open source ERP when we started our, our business. And there's absolutely no business for open source application. At least that's what I think. The, the big problem there is that you have a strong disconnect between your users and their ability to contribute. And if you have this uh, kind of a, a separation of the two, uh, you cannot build a community of any way, shape, or form because your users will not be able to contribute. So if your users are business users and cannot contribute code, uh, I don't see how you can create a successful open source project. Uh, case in point, if you look at most of the open source business application that exists out there, they are either failing as a commercial entity, and they usually have not a clear uh, separation of what's open source, what's the business, or they have kind of open core model where they frost the, the, and provide commercial widgets on top of the open source code. Uh, they usually are the, the ones that prefer the stronger copyleft, including Afero GPL, which probably makes uh, Bradley Coon pretty sad about, about that topic, uh, <laughs> where a lot of adoption of the Afero GPL is coming from actual commercial entity using that as a way to uh, uh, eventually monetize uh, their product. The other problem is that when you have this kind of settings, most of the time they require contributor license agreements, so you don't have a shared copyright, and all these are barriers to build a community. Uh, we don't have any of these. Uh, for us, things are very clear. Uh, uh, everything that's 
touching the code, and that's all the, the analysis tools were, that we're talking about are free and open source. Uh, the one tool which is commercial is a tool for legal team and business team to figure out and manage kind of a dashboard of uh, uh, all the licensing and compliance and policies of what they have in their products. And these guys would never contribute. Uh, now, they have some cash, so they're parting some of their cash with us, which allows to us to work also uh, on the open source side and, and sustain uh, a small business that we enjoyed a lot. Right. Now, I did notice actually in your Git repository, you have another project called About Code that has a thing called About Code Manager that uh, actually looks very useful and very sexy. Uh, it's a, um, uh, it, it appears to be a, 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 an anal analyzing tool for the output of scan code. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's uh, we've not announced it formally, but it's been out there and started to be used. It's a desktop application um, to review scans and reach conclusions and and deal with eventually large volumes of uh, of code. I've, I think somebody reported that they were trying to load a, a gigabyte size scan uh, in in the About Code Manager, and they, they, they were able to do it successfully. So uh, it's emerging project. It starts to be used. It's so useful that I'm actually using it at times. And so that's a good sign. If I uh, drop the command line and start using GUI tools, it usually, usually means that the GUI is done right. It's based on uh, Electron, which is the, the kind of weird framework uh, created by GitHub to build editors. So one editor is called Atom. It's also the base for Visual Studio Code at Microsoft. And it's a way to build desktop applications using web technologies. So you basically have embedded in Electron, the framework, a Chromium web browser and a node runtime. And you're building kind of a desktop fat application, but using web technologies is actually quite neat. Uh, except I hate JavaScript, so it's not so neat, but that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I can write, write JavaScript if I'm really under duress and, 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 and you're, 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 you're menacing to torture me, I will. Um, nevertheless, it's a very cool tool um, because it provides a way for a non-technical person to review uh, technical data coming from a scan. Right, and it, so I saw that it, it, you know, it's got several different views of the code. There's a, a a graph view that you can get up that shows you all the nodes in the in the code. This is presumably uh, a, a research tool rather than actually providing any kind of a, uh, a, 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 a timeline or a Gantt chart for approval. Presumably, that's what Deja Code does: is is provide you with a dashboard for your legal team. Yeah, so there's uh, th there's not so much uh, limitation on what we want to do in, in About Code Manager. It's just that we've not been able to do all the things we need. The tool is really meant to be used to review scans and reach conclusions. And mm -hmm. uh, it's not tied specifically to, to Deja Code in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we have the ambition to have the scan code server to transform that in something that will be a, a store for all the timeline of your scans, including being able to interact naturally through an API with, uh, with the About Code Manager as a primary input. So you could have scans that exist over there, fetch them in your UI so you can review them locally, uh, send back your conclusion over there, and, and again, wouldn't need any of uh, proper tools for that. Again, there's absolutely no, no need for any of our tools uh, uh, or, or free and open source tools to, to have any of the commercial tools, just icing on the cake. And frankly, uh, I wish personally that we wouldn't have to ever write any of these scanning tools and that everything was clear and, and well known everywhere. Uh, I, I hope someday that I can replace scan code by grep um, and, and, <laughs> and that, that the problem will be solved. Uh, we, we, Licensing shouldn't be a problem we, we would have to solve. So it's just small contribution to the edifice to ensure that eventually licensing becomes a problem of the past. Uh, we can dream, can't we? Yes, yes. Uh, so so uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a little look at the um, the uh, the GitHub uh, uh, 
tickers for the projects. Looks like you yep. do the lion's share of the development on ScanCode. Uh, how much community contribution do you actually have? Is there very much? Um, it, it, it comes and goes, uh, but uh, I, 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 I look at doing, I, I do the big changes on the core architecture, and that involves in some case uh, committing thousands of files. So to a certain extent, the, the level of my contributions are probably overstated. Uh, but we have employees of NextB that contribute, of course. Uh, we have folks from many other places, either as users and or contributors. So we, we receive contribution of uh, Red Hat, for instance. Uh, Red Hat uses scan code as part of uh, OpenShift Analytics. Mm -hmm. uh, th right. th so I've heard, and at least uh, the part of OpenShift that's open source, which is pretty much everything, uh, clearly use scan code. I know the Eclipse Foundation using scan code as part of their uh, IP due diligence process. Uh, and, you know, that's always the thing about uh, free and open source software project is that if things work, you don't know about your, your users, right? They don't complain. Everything <laughs> is work, working fine. I remember having a chat a couple of years back with uh, Jörg Janke. He was the lead of a project called Compierre for an open source ERP. And he was telling me, you know, it's funny because business-wise, each time we have a release that was pushed a bit too quickly and there are fewer more bugs than usual, we're starting to have a lot of sign-up for support contracts. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we also discover a lot of the users we have, we had no ideas where we're using our tool. So he, he was saying, maybe I should be a bit more devilish and now and then push a few uh, crappy release to make sure we get either more <laughs> revenue or we know more about who is using our tool. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we have a few uh, uh, folks and teams which are very active and contributing a lot. Um, one of the upcoming projects I'm working on is a, a tiny project to eventually scan and curate uh, everything out there. So it's a, it's a tiny project, of course, right? Wow. It's, you're tiny. talking about me? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and... And uh, that's something we'll, we'll, we'll be talking uh, sometimes at the beginning of March. So uh, I, I'm not alone on that. I don't want to talk too, too soon about it. Um, and you may have heard about it, Simon, by the way, um, uh, because it's, it's likely to be incubated under uh, DOSI and opensource.org. Uh, but mm -hmm. the goal is, is very simply to uh, build a community of uh, folks interested in licensing and ensuring that every project has clear licensing information. And again, yep. whether you are Richard Stallman, RMS posted an article back in December on the topic, uh, or John Sullivan at the Free Software Foundation, uh, he made a talk at FOSDEM exactly on the topic. Uh, license clarity is important. Um, if you're in a proprietary setting or in a large software foundation like Apache or Eclipse, licensing clarity is important. So everybody, whatever your concerns and your stance and position with regards to some style of licensing, has the same interest, which is we want to ensure that license is clear. And hopefully we may be able to make a small dent and, uh, and hope to make the, the floss world a better place in the end. That'd be good. Well, I, I've got the. Uh, I'm, in fact, I, I have an email here asking me for my quote as OSI president about the announcement for that project you were just describing there. So uh, I had better get on with that after the show and make sure that we can announce it. Uh, so, it's, uh, is there? There's no kind of a Git plugin for this, so that I can let GitHub just tell me all the licenses that are in my source tree. Is there? Because that would be ever so useful. When I'm doing these shows, I would love to be able to press a button and see what's in there. Um, so, so there is some code that lives in a branch for the scan code server. Um, uh, so, there is something that start, was started to be worked on, but it's not yet there. Uh, and that would require to keep an instance of the scan code server running at all time, uh, which I'm not sure I'm able to, to cater to. Uh, but I'll, I'll check it out. I mean, it's not a big deal. We have already the integrations with the, the GitHub service worked out. And uh, so it's just a matter of uh, finishing the work. And 
of course, you need an instance that's up and running. I've also commented a GitHub Summer of Code project last year for the Eclipse from, for the SPDX working group, uh, where one of the students actually created such GitHub integration. And I think it's using scan code too, I don't recall anymore. Um, but again, the, the whole point is that you need to have a running instance of some always reachable server if you want to offer any kind of uh, service like that. It'd be great if GitHub would want to, to do it because frankly, the, the licensing information they provide is, uh, is really very shallow. I mean, they don't claim it's perfect, but they provide it. So they went through the effort to write some code for that with a tool called Licensee. It's, it's a great first pass, but it's, it's pretty shallow in terms of uh, the depth and the quality of the information it collects on, on the licensing of repo. So um, they should use scan code. There's uh, some project out there, I don't remember the name, and they're going to yell at me for not remembering the name, where uh, it uses the GitHub webhooks to automatically run continuous integration as check-ins are made. And I wonder if you could do a similar thing for uh, like an off-site project that you would give a GitHub API for, uh, auth key for, uh, that would do scan code every time you checked into GitHub. Yeah, well, that's that's exactly what, what we have in this branch for, on the, for, for the scan code server. Oh, great. Cool, cool. All right. Well, it's already done then. All right. Hey, we're almost it's, out of time. It's, it's there, but yeah, but it's, it's not fully polished, but it's almost there. Okay. Maybe some more contribution to that might make that work. Yeah, I, I hate cutting Simon off. It so sounds like he had like 40 more questions he could have asked you, but we're right up against <laughs> the end of the hour. So I kind of have to I kind of have to say, whoa, let's cut back. So I have three important questions I have to ask, and then we got to let you go. Uh, the number, f number one is, and this is always hard to do because you're going to do a set difference in your head. Is there anything we didn't cover that you wanted to make sure was covered today? I I don't think so. I, I just said that it's a tool that's easy to use. Um, it's essential to know about the, the licensing of the code that you use or contribute to. So just download and use it. Um, we have a fairly active community, uh, a lot of pull requests uh, so far, a lot of great small and large users. So join the fray and have fun. Cool. And uh, I can already tell the answer to the next question. What's your favorite scripting language? Uh, JavaScript. No, I was kidding. <laughs> Perl, no, I was kidding again. <laughs> no, I, I should have. I should. I should have taken Perl. But the day Schwartzian transforms were made possible in Python, I switched to Python. So I, I used to be doing a lot of things in Java. Uh, I have a hard time to understand how I was able to stand and support that. Um, so Python, no question. And what's your favorite text editor? Uh, that's that's going to be a surprise for you. Eclipse. Okay. I've been a long time Eclipse committer, and um, I I dabble in Vim. Otherwise, I, I I could probably break my computer and get stuck for ages trying to exit Emacs. So okay. I, I go with Vim from the command line and Eclipse otherwise. Well, okay. Hey, Philippe, it's been really good to have you on, uh, and uh, there's a lot of depth to this that I actually wasn't aware of just doing the quick bit of research on there. So uh, there, you're, you're solving a thorny problem, and you're apparently doing it fairly well, and uh, uh, especially you know big companies like Red Hat and stuff are, are using it as well. So thank you for coming on the show and talking about uh, scan code and the rest of your projects. Thank you very much. It's been a blast. Cool. That was, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name. I should have just asked him there. The Philippe, uh, oh, no, I'm, no, I can't see it on my screen. I hate it when it does that. Oh, that didn't work either. Well, it, it starts with Philippe. That's the part I remember. <laughs> look look at the show that, notes. That, but, but you, you, oh, you, you, you get it exactly right. You get it oh, exactly really? right. That's just say awesome. ombre dan. Ombre dan. All right. That's okay. it. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. No, go away. Bye. <laughs> okay. So, so, Simon, what do you think? <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I, I, you know, I really like it. I, uh, one of the things that I do for my clients is I help them uh, deal with licensing problems. And um, this is a tool that uh, I have in my toolkit from now onwards. Um, you know, we, what we always used to do was uh, go and get commercial providers to provide those reports and then run through the spreadsheets. And from now on, there's really no reason not to use scan code and then the about code manager to do all the work. And uh, the best thing of all is I can still charge all my fees because the expertise is in the bit that they don't do, which is the license incompatibilities.
Right, right. That sounds like a great opportunity for you then. And yeah, this is it's fascinating stuff. And licensing is, you know, important because there's so much going on these days. And with all these different open source licenses and things and trying to de uh, detect all those, it's not just a matter of simply grepping for something. Now you actually have to figure out what they've actually done. Did they add an extra clause? Did they make it a five clause BSD license? You know, maybe, maybe there's a few of those out there. All right, enough of that. Got to keep moving here. So upcoming guests, we have the uh, Pearl Foundation next week, my friend Jim Brandt who I've known for many years. Uh, actually, he was a client of mine for a while at the University at Buffalo. Uh, he's now the uh, head of the dude for the Pearl Foundation. Uh, and Simon, you are specifically excluded from being anything to do with this show, okay? right? You are you cannot come on this show. I'm probably going to hope Aaron comes back. Aaron's had to take a leave of absence from the show for a while, but I think he said he can come back for next week, and that's good because he's an old pro programmer, so uh, that would also be nice. Following that, GitLab, which is the open source GitHub, and you could either have that local, like we have here at ZipRecruiter, or uh, you can have it hosted somewhere, and so it's just like really just using GitHub, but it's GitLab, okay? Uh, following that, Gitcoin, which is the easiest way to monetize or incentivize Floss work by allowing uh, people to contribute Ethereum uh, for uh, solved bugs and things like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, Suse, Susa, Susa, I'll get this right eventually. Very old and popular Linux distro. Alan Clark's going to come and talk about that. Uh, we have Etsy, Etsy Viper Builder, which unfortunately I didn't know what that was, but between last week and this week, all I know better now is it's scaffolding for building apps in a clean way with Viper architecture, which is View, Interactor, Presenter, Entity, Router. Uh, that's uh, more letters than MVVM and MVC and things like that, but it's only for iOS development. So it's an open source tool to help you develop uh, software that you ship into the app store. So um, that's just the way that works. Just out of the schedule, I'm very happy about this. I saw this guy at um, uh, All Things Open last October, and he finally got back to me. Uh, this is Rust, the programming language Rust, developed by Mozilla. Uh, it's a systems programming language that uh, runs blazingly fast, prevents seg faults, and guarantees thread safety. I am really looking forward to that. Uh, I talked with some of the guys locally here, and they've been building stuff with it. So uh, looking forward to that. One more language for your toolkit. Uh, then following that, uh, the last scheduled person we have so far is Pigeon, Live Purple, and Game, which are the multiple chat protocols. The, the IRC is in there. Uh, the old AIM protocol is in there. Yahoo protocol. Basically, everything that Adium does and Game does, GAIM does, uh, this is the library behind that. So we've got somebody talking about that. Uh, if you have any other suggestions about projects, please tell the project leader or community coordinator to email me. You can find my email address at uh, twit.tv slash floss. That's the homepage for this show. You can also see the big spreadsheet, as I like to call it, of the upcoming guests, their schedule, this precise schedule, and also who we're working on trying to get to. So if you have any other suggestions, just let me know. We have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. We took a number of questions from there. Actually, the number wasn't zero this time. We actually took a couple questions from there. Uh, you can follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google Plus and at Merlin on Twitter. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. And I have a couple things to read from the home office. Did you know that the Twit flashing briefing is now available in Canada? Australia, the United Kingdom, and India. It's been in the U.S. for a while, so now is the perfect time to go into your Alexa app settings and under Flash Briefing, look for Twit. And also, it's time for our yearly Twit survey, and we want to hear from you so we can serve you better. Head over to twit.tv slash survey and be heard. I will be at SoCal Linux Expo, also called Scale, in about three weeks. If you see me there, please come up and say hi and let me know you watch the show. Or if you have a suggestion for a guest that's uh, actually appearing there, let me know that too, and I'll go talk to them at the show. Uh, and I'll be there actually also as a speaker, so I'll be wearing two badges like I did a couple of years ago, where I'm going to be talking about Flutter, which is the uh, iOS and Android development platform uh, that uses Dart as its core. Uh, that should be a really fun presentation. Uh, Simon, any brief uh, plugins you want to do? Uh, I'm really very relaxed here, Randall. I'm still um, <laughs> I'm still very keen for anybody in Western Europe to come along to Og Camp on August the 18th in Sheffield in the United Kingdom. That's a uh, a free software and free culture conference that is going to have lots of cool speakers uh, uh, and me as well. And uh, you can buy your tickets now at ogcamp.org. That's O-G-G-C-A-M-P.org. Uh, I really recommend you buy your tickets before the rush comes in because uh, in previous years we've run out and you should uh, buy early because uh, you buying early allows us to pay the bills early as well. Um, apart from that, you can find me on as Webmink in most places. Uh, you're welcome to visit my company website, meshedinsights.com, where uh, all the things that I write get echoed. And uh, you're welcome to sponsor me on Patreon so that I can carry on doing things without anybody else paying me. Uh, apart from that, nothing else to plug, Randall. 
And Simon, I want to definitely uh, thank you for uh, your what five out of the last six shows you've been on. It's I really appreciate that, including hosting the show too, which is just uh, really helping me out quite a bit. You definitely need a vacation. Your vacation is next week. I will definitely not look for you next week at all. But we'll probably get uh, probably get, we'll, we'll get somebody else who knows Pearl on. That'll be kind of nice. Or it's actually fluent in Pearl. So Simon, thank you very much. And uh, we got to go. So we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. 